This is lecture five for microbiology. This is going to correspond to chapter five in both the Tetra and Bauman talks. Today what we're looking at is metabolism, nutrition, and growth. Metabolism is the sum of all of the chemical reactions that occur in a cell. There's eight elementary statements that apply to metabolism overall. First, every cell acquires nutrients. So all cells are going to have to take in nutrients. Two, metabolism requires energy from light or catabolism of nutrients. A cell is going to have to get energy from something, whether it be from sunlight or breaking other things down. Three, energy is stored in the bonds of ATP. So ATP is our energy currency. It's going to be how we store the energy we use other places. Just like you go to pay work to get a paycheck, and your paycheck is going to be given to you in U.S. dollars, you're going to use those U.S. dollars to pay for other things in your life. Number four, enzymes are used to catabolize nutrients into precursor metabolites. So all of the reactions are going to have enzymes that are involved in helping to control them and facilitate them taking place in cellular conditions. Number five, ATP and other enzymes are used to do anabolism with precursor metabolites. So you're going to take those parts that you broke down from breaking down larger things in catabolism, and you're going to use those to build other things. It would be like getting something that's been built out of Legos, taking all the Legos apart, and then using those individual Legos to build something different. Number six, you use ATP to link building blocks through its linearization. So ATP will provide your energy to let these reactions occur. Number seven, cells grow by assembling macromolecules into structures. And eight, they usually reproduce when they're about double in size. If we look at the types of reactions we have in a cell, two main types, catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is going to break larger products down into smaller products, and it's going to release ATP in the process. Anabolism is going to synthesize things into larger products from your smaller ones. These are going to require the input of ATP. How we typically look at things is through metabolic pathways, which are sequences of chemical reactions. Rather than just looking at reactions randomly in the cell, if we look at these pathways, we can put them into a logical order and see the steps that are taken to make several of the products in a cell. Many of the types of reactions we see are going to be redox reactions. These will involve the transfer of electrons from an electron donor molecule to an electron acceptor. Reduction is going to be accepting electrons. Oxidation is donation of electrons. In chemistry, they use the mnemonic oil rig. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. Most biological oxidations are going to involve the loss of hydrogen atoms. So they're also called dehydrations. We have a few different molecules that we use as common electron carriers. The electron carriers end up being used to synthesize ATP. First one, NAD+, which is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NADP+, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, and FAD+, which is flavin adenine dinucleotide. When we produce ATP, cells are going to phosphorylate ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, to make ATP adenosine triphosphate. There's a few different ways this can happen. First is substrate level phosphorylation. Here you transfer something from an organic compound to ATP, to transfer the phosphate. With oxidative phosphorylation, this is done in respiration, electrons are transferred to electron carriers like NAD plus and FAD plus. And then in photophosphorylation, you use light energy to make ATP. Enzymes are an important part of metabolism. The enzyme collision theory says that all atoms are continuously moving and colliding. And the energy transferred by the particles during the collision can be enough to disrupt the electron structures can disrupt the structures enough to break chemical bonds and then form new ones. Your substrate is going to be the substance the enzyme is going to act on. And enzymes can have different classes. Here are some examples of classes of enzymes. An enzyme is an organic catalyst that increases the likelihood of a reaction without being permanently changed in the process. 
Enzyme names are pretty easy. Most of their names are going to end in ASE. Hydrolases are going to catabolize molecules by adding water in decomposition hydrolysis. Isomerases are going to rearrange atoms, so they do not add or remove anything, they just rearrange them. Ligases or polymerases join molecules together. These are anabolic, they're going to build things. Lyases are going to split like molecules without using water. Hydrolases split to molecules by using water. Oxidoreductases are going to be catabolic and anabolic. They'll remove an electron to oxidize or add an electron to reduce various substrates. And transferases are going to transfer functional groups. They, they tend to be anabolic as well. Looking at enzyme structure and function, an apoenzyme is going to be the protein portion that is inactive if it's not bound to its non-protein cofactor. Cofactors are going to be inorganic ions or organic coenzymes. Some examples of inorganic ions would be iron, magnesium, zinc, or copper. Coenzymes tend to be vitamins or contain vitamins. They're required for metabolism, but they cannot be synthesized. Oftentimes people will talk about how they feel like they have no energy because of taking some vitamins. It's not that the vitamins are being broken down to yield energy. The vitamins are acting as coenzymes to allow the enzymes to function and break down energy from the actual substrates. Coloenzyme is going to be the active enzyme formed by binding of an apoenzyme with the cofactors. Ribozyme is when you have RNA molecules that will act as enzymes themselves. Reactivation energy is important when we look at enzymes. This is the amount of energy needed to trigger a chemical reaction. Your reaction rate is going to be the frequency of collisions that sustain enough energy to bring about a reaction. These will depend on the number of reactant molecules at or above the activation energy level. So this is why heat increases the reaction rate, because it's going to increase the energy in the system. The activation site is going to be the enzyme's functional site. The enzyme will become associated with a specific substrate molecule. Then it will bind to form a temporary compound, which is your enzyme substrate complex. The bonds within the substrate are broken to form new products. If you're doing an anabolic reaction, you're going to have new bonds formed. Then the enzyme dissociates and it resumes its original configuration. This can happen over and over very quickly. Your turnover number is the maximum number of substrate molecules an enzyme can convert to a product each second. This is usually between 1 and 10,000, but it can actually be as high as 500,000. Temperature will tend to increase the rate of a reaction, but this isn't without its own issues. It may get too high, in which case it would inactivate the enzyme. Enzymes are going to have an optimal temperature that they will function at. If it gets too high, you can run into denaturation, where the non-covalent bonds break and the protein will lose its three-dimensional structure. At this point, it's no longer functional. Now remember, proteins are sensitive to heat, pH, and salt concentration. pH extremes can actually denature enzymes as well. So here we have a little video on how enzymes work. It's an animation that you may find helpful. Again, you'll have to watch that outside of this lecture video. When we look at the enzyme substrate concentration, that can affect how quickly the reactions take place in some, some circumstances. As the, as the concentration of the substrate increases, enzyme activity will tend to increase. And then as more enzymes active sites bind, more substrate until you finally reach a saturation point. Once you've reached the saturation point, adding more substrate is not going to increase the rate. The enzyme is already working as fast as it can. So the concentration of the enzyme can be a way to control the reactions. Your allosteric site is a binding site on the enzyme other than where the substrate binds. Inhibitors are going to be substances that will block enzymes. We have different types, competitive inhibitors, 
are going to fit the enzyme active site and prevent normal substrate binding. Non-competitive inhibitors do not bind the active site, but instead the allosteric site where on the molecule it will alter the shape of the active site. With feedback inhibition, this is used to control enzyme activity. You can have allosteric inhibitors. With metabolic feedback inhibition, it's sometimes called end product inhibition. There's a little video animation here that will show allosteric inhibition. We're going to start to look at carbohydrate metabolism. We look at cellular respiration and fermentation as part of this process. With cellular respiration, you have the complete breakdown of glucose to carbon dioxide in water. This begins with glycolysis, and your final electron acceptor in this process is oxygen. Fermentation will break down glucose, and it results in organic waste products. It also begins with glycolysis, but your final electron acceptor is a molecule made in the cell, something other than oxygen. Cellular respiration has a few parts to it. The first is glycolysis. In this portion, no oxygen is needed. It occurs in most cells in the cytoplasm. You start out with one glucose, and it is broken down into two pyruvates. In this process, you have a net gain of two ATP. It's sometimes referred to as the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway. In the Krebs cycle, you have the complete oxidation of the substrate. And then ATP is made through redox reactions. The Krebs cycle itself will produce 2 GTP, 2 FADH2, 6 NADH, and 6 carbon dioxide from one glucose. Pyruvate itself cannot enter the Krebs cycle directly, so it has to undergo a decarboxylation reaction and lose carbon dioxide. The remaining acetyl group then attaches to coenzyme A to make acetyl-CoA. The carbon dioxide from this step and Krebs cycle ultimately ends up in the atmosphere. The final part of this is the electron transport chain, which involves a series of membrane-bound carrier molecules that pass electrons to a final electron acceptor. As they do this, it creates a hydrogen pump gradient to make ATP. This here is the process of glycolysis. You don't need to know all of these intermediate steps. However, sometimes seeing them all laid out in front of you will make it a little bit easier. You start out with glucose. In order to get glucose broken down and get the reaction started, you are going to have to put a little bit of energy in. This is sometimes referred to as your energy investment phase. So ATP is going to be put into the reaction. You'll actually take the phosphate off of ATP, which leaves ADP behind, and you're going to stick it on the glucose on carbon number 6 to make glucose 6-phosphate. That's going to get rearranged to make fructose 6-phosphate, and you're going to have to invest a little bit more energy here. So another ATP is going to be invested, taking the phosphate and sticking it on carbon number 1 this time. So you'll have fructose 1,6-diphosphate. This will become rearranged to make dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And this will end up producing two glyceraldehyde-free phosphate molecules. So there are two of these molecules from this point forward. At this point, we're going to move some electrons. So you'll have NAD plus form NADH. We're going to then form 1,3-diphosphoglycerate. That's going to rearrange to 3-phosphoglycerate. During this step, you're going to actually remove a phosphorus and put it on ADP to form ATP. So here you have two of these molecules, so you're actually paying back those initial two ATP that you had to invest to get the process started. We'll rearrange to make 2-phosphoglycerate and then phosphorinopyruvate, finally removing the last phosphorus again to make two more ATP in the process of making two pyruvate. So here's an animation to this process happening. I would encourage you to watch as many of these animations as you can with metabolism. It does seem to be helpful to get it in different words and view it a few different ways. The next step is the Krebs cycle. So here we have the pyruvate. And the pyruvate, remember, cannot go directly into the Krebs cycle. 
So instead, what you're going to do is you're going to remove the carbon dioxide and have it join with coenzyme A. So now you'll have acetyl-CoA. In the process of doing that, remember you're going to have two pyruvates that are going to come in, so you'll end up with two acetyl-CoAs from your one glucose. This removes some electrons, so you will receive NADH off of this process. A total of two of them, because you had two pyruvates making two acetyl-CoAs. This will then join into the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle is labeled the TCA cycle here. This cycle is also known as the citric acid cycle, citrate cycle, tricarboxylic acid cycle, and TCA cycle. So they are all the same thing. The two carbons from the acetyl-CoA are going to join with four carbons from oxaloacetate to make your six-carbon citrate. That is going to rearrange itself to make isocitrate. Isocitrate is then going to remove a carbon dioxide and some electrons with it to give you NADH. And you will have alpha-ketobutyrate formed. You're down to five carbons here. The five carbon alpha-ketobutyrate <coughs> will then remove another carbon dioxide. More NADH is produced and you'll be down to the four carbon succinyl-CoA. That will rearrange to make succinate then fumarate, and then malate, and oxaloacetate. As it does that, the succinyl-CoA to succinate is going to release a little bit of energy, this time in the form of GTP. GTP is going to be very similar to ATP, and it will actually be immediately converted to ATP right after it is formed. When you convert the succinate to fumarate, you're going to move some more electrons again here, and that's when you're going to take FAD and make it into FADH2. And then the rearrangement of fumarate to malate and malate to oxaloacetate in that last step again, moving some more electrons and making some more NADH. This is an animation of the process happening. What I would always do is if, after you look at the process, watch the animations, come back to this somewhere here. These are really your key points of what is going on in each of these stages. If you can see where, how you get from one glucose to two pyruvates, where you have a net gain of two ATP, that's what you want to be focusing on. If you can see how you get each of these products in here, that's really what you want to focus on with the Krebs cycle. Another pathway we can use is the pentose phosphate pathway. Here you take five carbon sugars like ribulose, cellulose, and ribose that are formed from glucose 6-phosphate. These are precursors to other anabolic pathways like the synthesis of nucleotides. This, pro this pathway is going to only have a net gain of one ATP. It's sometimes referred to as your HMP shunt or hexose monophosphate shunt. So this is showing here where you can have these products come off the intermediates to go on and do purine and pyrimidine metabolism. Really the key things you want to know are summarized here. So the Entner duodor pathway, this is a substitute for glycolysis in some bacteria. This will yield precursor metabolites and 1 ATP. This is going to catabolize glucose to pyruvate, but it's going to use different enzymes than glycolysis. A couple organisms that can use this are Pseudomonas and Enterococcus fecalis. It also produces 2 NADPH. Here the organism can metabolize glucose without glycolysis or the pentose phosphate pathway. So here you can see you start out with glucose and you end up making pyruvate here or the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, it can go on and produce pyruvic acid and onto ethanol. The electron transport chain, this is going to be where you take energy from electrons and it's used to pump hydrogen ions in the cristae of the mitochondria. You have these carrier proteins 
that are going to transport electrons down through the membrane. This happens in the mitochondrial inner membrane space. So NADH starts at complex 1. FADH2 is going to come in a little bit later here. So this is another picture of the electron transport chain. So with your NADH coming in, as you move the NADH, you're going to pump a hydrogen ion across at these protein carriers. FADH2 starting a little bit later, a little further down the line, when it moves its electrons in, it's also going to pump hydrogen ions across. So for NADH, it's going to pump three hydrogens across for each one. For FADH2, it's only going to pump two across for each one. What this is going to do is create your electrochemical gradient here by having your separated positive charges from the hydrogen ion and your electrons. They want to come back together, and what's going to allow this to happen is your ATP synthase enzyme. When those hydrogens come back across, you're going to have them combine with your oxygen and your electrons to form water, but you're also going to have ATP become phosphorylated to become ADP. So your carrier proteins are going to pass the electrons down the chain. So we've got the three complexes here that are passing them down, and then your fourth complex at the very end. Your flavor proteins are going to contain flavin, which is, comes from vitamin B2 or riboflavin. Flavor mononucleotide, FMN, is your initial carrier molecule that you see at the beginning. Your ubiquinones are non-protein carriers derived from vitamin K. This includes coenzyme A and the mitochondrion. We have some metal-containing proteins. The metals will alternate between reduced and oxidized states. So you can use iron in various organisms. Some of them will use copper that do photosynthesis. Your cytochromes, these are integral proteins that are associated with heme. Iron will go between your plus 2 and plus 3 states. There are other carrier molecules. The carrier molecules tend to be pretty diverse in bacteria. So chemiosmosis is the use of that ion gradient that generate ATP. That's what we have here that this enzyme is going to be working with that gradient. Your proton gradient has the potential energy, is your proton motive force. This is used to propel down the electrochemical gradient through a protein channels called the ATPases or ATP synthase. ATP synthase is this last protein channel that's going to phosphorylate ADP to ATP. With oxidative phosphorylation, your proton gradient is created by the oxidation of the components of the electron transport chain. So here we've got some more information where you can look at some videos of the electron transport chain. With anaerobic respiration, your final electron acceptor is an inorganic substance other than oxygen. The amount of ATP generated here varies with the organism in the pathway. The ATP yield is never as high as it is in the aerobic organisms, so your anaerobes are going to grow more slowly than the aerobes. Some examples include Pseudomonas and Bacillus, which can use the nitrate ion, and the desulfovibrio, which can use sulfate. So in fermentation, you have the partial oxidation of sugar or other metabolites. This is done to release energy using the organic molecule as an electron acceptor rather than the electron transport chain. It's going to oxidize NADH to NAD+, and reduce the organic molecule as the final electron acceptor. Microbes can produce a variety of fermentation products. Acetic acid, ethanol, lactic acid are just a few of them. Here we're going to look at lactic acid fermentation and alcohol fermentation. With lactic acid fermentation, it begins with glycolysis. Some organisms that would do this, Streptococcus and Lactobacillus, they convert pyruvate to lactic acid and replenish NAD+. So we do start with glycolysis here and produce pyruvate. When oxygen is not present, it cannot go into the mitochondria and the electron transport chain. So what it's going to do if you're doing lactic acid fermentation is it will then be converted into lactate. 
one of the things you need to keep glycolysis going is a source of NAD plus to take electrons and become NADH. What the conversion of pyruvate to lactate does is it, it will take NADH and convert it back into NAD plus so that you can continue to have glycolysis going and continue to produce ATP. <coughs> With alcohol fermentation, you take the pyruvate, and it's going to have a carbon dioxide be produced, and then make acetaldehyde. The acetaldehyde will then be converted into ethanol. That last step, again, you're going to help to sustain glycolysis by taking the NADH and converting it back to NAD+. So the whole point of doing the fermentation is to provide a source of NAD plus so you can continue to have glycolysis carry on and produce the energy. So there are other types of microbial fermentation other than this. The propionibacterium produce propionic acid. This is used in Swiss cheese. Lactic acid is used in cheddar cheese, yogurt, soy sauce, ethanol in wine and beer. Acetone and isopropanol used in things like nail polish remover and rubbing alcohol. So they definitely have a lot of uses for us. Other pathways with lipid catabolism, you have lipase hydrolyze the bonds of the fatty acids to glycerol. Through beta oxidation, you're going to degrade the fatty acids by splitting off pairs of hydrogen hydrocarbons. You'll pull them off two at a time and use them to make acetyl-CoA to enter the Krebs cycle. With protein catabolism, most cells are only going to catabolize protein when carbon from glucose and fat is not available. This is not a preferred source of energy for most cells. Some organisms, particularly the food spoilers, normally catabolize proteins. So they start out with the amination, they'll remove the amine group, and then it recycles or removes the nitrogen waste. Proteases are going to split the proteins into the amino acids. So some reactions that you would have, decarboxylation removes the carboxyl group, desulfurization removes the sulfhydryl group. Because so many different bacteria can do different types of metabolism, biochemical tests can be used to help identify them. These different species will a lot of times produce different enzymes. So if you look at the enzymes that a cell has, that can be a way of identifying it when they do tend to all look very similar underneath the microscope. So here we have an additional animation of some of the biochemical pathways. With photosynthesis, you're going to capture light energy and use it to drive the synthesis of carbohydrate from carbon dioxide in water. So with cellular respiration, you're going to take carbohydrate and break it down into carbon dioxide and water. With photosynthesis, it's the exact opposite. You're going to use carbon dioxide and water to make carbohydrate and oxygen. Chlorophyll is going to be the substance that captures the light energy. The hydrocarbon tail attached to the light absorbing active site is centered around magnesium. The chlorophylls vary on the wavelengths of light they will absorb. So this is why you will see plants that will have different shades of green for the different pigments. The photosystem is your light harvesting matrices that are made from chlorophyll and other pigments in the protein matrix. These are embedded in the thylakoids. So the thylakoids are going to be those folds that you have in the eukaryotic cells, the inner folds of the chloroplasts. In prokaryotes that don't have chloroplasts, these are going to be invaginations of the cytoplasmic membrane. So again, there's some more animations of this process. So we start with the light-dependent reactions. Here you're going to have light energy absorbed, and then you use redox reactions to store the energy in ATP and NADPH. They're dependent on light energy. So what will happen is you have a photon of light come in. It's going to react with the photosystem and cause an electron to become excited. That excited electron is going to be passed down this electron transport chain. And in the process, very similar to the electron transport chain used in cellular respiration, it's going to make some ATP. With your light-independent reactions, you're going to synthesize glucose from the carbon dioxide in water. This is not dependent on light energy. 
So light dependent reactions will occur in all photosynthetic organisms. We can have cyclic photophosphorylation and non-cyclic photophosphorylation. With cyclic photophosphorylation, you have photosystem 1 pigments absorb light energy, and it will transfer it till it arrives at the reaction center chlorophyll. As the electrons move, you're going to have the energy that is used to pump the hydrogen ions for the proton motive force, and then your final electron acceptor is your original reaction center chlorophyll. <coughs> it's going to come back to the same place that donated the electron. So the hydrogen gradient is going to be what drives phosphorylation. With non-cyclic photophosphorylation, this is going to be seen in all plants and algae. Some of the bacteria will do this as well. It's going to require two photosystems. You're going to have a photosystem 1 and a photosystem 2. So here, if we look at this one, this is going to show you cyclic photophosphorylation. Here, the electron is just going to come back to this original reaction center. Over here, you're going to have the electron get excited and it will go to another reaction center and become excited again. So light will excite the photosystem in photosystem 2. The electrons get passed to photosystem 1 and then photosystem 1 is going to be re energized with additional light. NATP is going to be reduced to make NADPH, and this is going to be used in the light independent reactions. So with non-cyclic photophosphorylation, you're going to constantly need to replenish the electrons to the center of photosystem 2. With cyclic, they're going to return so you don't have to constantly replenish them. So here is an example of being passed on to the second location. So in your light independent reactions, you begin with carbon fixation. Here is where you attach carbon dioxide to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, sometimes called RUBP. RUBP is going to be derived from a precursor metabolite of the pentose phosphate pathway so that your substrates can be regenerated. So here you're going to have carbon dioxide come in. It's going to join with your ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate here to make 3-phosphoglycerate. In the Calvin cycle, sometimes called the Calvin benzyl cycle, for every three carbon dioxides that go in, one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is going to be formed. So three carbons come in here. Glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate has three carbons. Glycolysis is going to be reversed in order to make glucose. So you're going to have to take two glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates and put them through the reverse of glycolysis to get glucose. So it's going to take three carbon dioxides to make one glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, two glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates to make one glucose. So there's three phases to this cycle. This first initial phase is carbon fixation. The next phase is reduction. Here you're going to be moving some electrons and removing the sugar off. The third and final phase here is where you're going to regenerate and rearrange the molecules again so that you come back to have your RUBP to begin the cycle all over again. So here again we have some animations of the Calvin cycle. Other pathways. An amphibolic reaction is going to be one that proceeds in either direction towards catabolism or anabolism. When we look at carbohydrate biosynthesis, glucose 3-phosphate is used as a starting point for synthesizing sugars and polysaccharides. With gluconeogenesis, you can have the synthesis of sugar from a non-carbohydrate precursor. Gluconeogenesis is essentially just the reverse of 
glycolysis. It literally means generates new glucose. Or glycolysis means lyse glucose. Lipid biosynthesis, fats are synthesized in reactions that are the reverse of the catabolic reactions. So glycerol from glucose 3-phosphate can be used, as well as taking the fatty acids by linking acetyl-CoA's together in order to make your triglyceride. Steroid synthesis is a little bit more complicated. With amino acid biosynthesis, here you synthesize the precursors from oh. glycolysis of Krebs, the pentose phosphate pathway, and other amino acids. These can all be used to convert and make amino acids. We have some amino acids that are essential and some that are non-essential amino acids. The non-essential amino acids you cannot produce in the cell. They have to be consumed by the organism. With amination, this is the addition of an amine group to a precursor metabolite. This would be used in making amino acids. Transamination is going to transfer an amine from one amino acid to another. These all use the coenzyme pyridoxal phosphate that's derived from vitamin B6. With nucleotide biosynthesis, you use your precursor metabolites from glycolysis and Krebs. Also, ribose and deoxyribose from ribose 5-phosphate in the pentose phosphate pathway. The phosphate group from ATP. And then your purines and pyrimidines from glutamic and ascorbic acid from the Krebs cycle and the leaves. So metabolism is going to be regulated in the cell. There's different ways that it can be regulated. These are some of the main ways of controlling it. You can synthesize or degrade channel proteins and transport proteins. You can synthesize enzymes to catabolize a substrate only if the substrate is available. If you have two energy sources available, the cell is going to choose to use the one that's more energy efficient. You can synthesize metabolites, but you will cease synthesis if it's available as a nutrient. So if you're able to just take it in from the outside, the cell will shut down production. Eukaryotes can isolate enzymes with membrane-bound organelles. You can turn things on and off with the allosteric sites on the enzymes. You can use negative feedback to shut things down when a product is in abundance. And you can regulate the pathways that use the same substrates by requiring different coenzymes. So when we control a gene, cells control the amount and the timing of a protein. So this can be a way of controlling enzyme production. When you control metabolic expression, cells control the activity of the proteins or the enzymes once they've been produced. So things can be controlled before you actually produce them or after you actually produce them.